Um, so today I'm going to be finishing some of what I was going to be saying about autoimmunity, um, and then I'm going to move into talking about hypersensitivity, um, which is a fancy immunologist term for allergy, um, as you will see. Um, these, this packet of slides, or this set of slides, are the slides I'm going to use both today and on Monday. Um, which is when I will be finishing the hypersensitivity part of this. So uh, I'm not going to be posting another set of slides for Monday. I'll be using the rest of these. Also, uh, one other thing sort of related to our conversation in lab yesterday. As we discussed in lab yesterday, your lab report, um, your final lab report will now be due on December 2nd. Um, there uh, was the uh, immunology lit assignment. Those on the schedule due on this coming Monday, um, but I smushed that back um, to the Monday after break. Um, I also realized there actually was, we actually did need to have one more inquisitive assignment. Um, so that is also going to be due the Monday after break. Remember that your lowest inquisitive is dropped. So if you don't feel like you need to do more inquisitive, that's fine too. <laughs> um, and in fact, both of those things, both the last inquisitive and the literature assignment are posted um, Do the Monday after break. So you have a week and a half or something to do those. So go to it. Um, but today we're going to continue talking about um, hypersensitivity and autoimmunity. Um, so we talked about a lot of specific ways that we can break tolerance last time um, that can be involved in uh, leading to autoimmunity. And now I want to kind of um, talk a little bit about some other uh, things that are related to autoimmunity, um, as well as some specific details of some autoimmune diseases. So we know that whenever we're seeing some kind of autoimmune disease, there was some kind of failure of tolerance um, that had to happen. We talked about some ways that tolerance could be broken last time. Um, but we can also think a little bit about some other details of what leads to some of those failures of tolerance. Um, and as you can see here, some of this um, can be linked to genetics, while some can be linked to infection and other environmental exposures. Um, and we saw kind of some ways in which perhaps infection might lead to tolerance breaks last time. Um, when we do uh, different types of studies, we can find a number of different genetic associations with autoimmune diseases. Here you can see all of the human chromosomes. And little marks, little shapes, for if that particular, for regions of the chromosome that have been statistically associated with different diseases. So you can see that there are um, some regions of the chromosome that might be related to, say, just asthma. And you can also see that there are some regions of the chromosome that seem to be related to many diseases as well. So you can see that, you know, if you've got some Hit some overlapping hits here, uh, right there on chromosome six. Um, so there are lots of different things we can think about in terms of genetic associations with autoimmunity. By far, the strongest association, the gene that is the most associated with autoimmunity, is MHC. Um, in fact, I have definitely seen um, some papers where people have spent huge amounts of money to do these big genetic studies to find the genes responsible for such and such disease, and then they come up with MHC. And I'm like, thank you, Captain Obvious. Um, so MHC by far is the thing that is the biggest uh, factor. And you can imagine that, sort of as we talked about last time, a lot of this can be related to being able to present a particular antigen um, on your MHC. So you can see, for example, with 
uh, some autoimmune diseases like ankylosing spondylitis. Um, patients have a dramatically um, uh, increased frequency of a particular um, HLA type. It seems like if you have that HLA type, HLA B27, you are much more likely to end up with ankylosing spondylitis um, because you could imagine you are presenting a problematic self antigen. Um, you can also see there are um, things like type 1 diabetes where um, you are unlikely to have HLA DQ6. So there are both you know, situations where having a particular MHC type makes you super susceptible and having a particular MHC type makes you uh, very much less susceptible. Um, there are other genes, of course, that show up when we look for genetic associations with autoimmune diseases. And some of those other uh, genes are shown here. What you can notice is that they fall into some groups that make some sense. For example, a lot of them are cytokines or cytokine receptors. <laughs> you could imagine if you're making too much or the wrong amount or the wrong time of some cytokine or receptor, that could predispose you to autoimmunity. Some things that are involved in the innate immune response, some things that are involved in adhesion or co-stimulation, some things that are involved in antigen presentation. So after MHC, these all rank after MHC in terms of um, the genetic association, we see a lot of other genes that are involved in immune responses that seem to be um, associated with autoimmune disease. This sort of data, as well as the data that we saw on the previous slide, is sort of all data that's coming from thinking about, um, you know, looking at the population as a whole to try to figure out who has autoimmune diseases and think about who might be at risk. And when you do that kind of an analysis where you look at everybody in the population and try to figure out, see who has autoimmune diseases, who doesn't, there's one other thing that stands out super dramatically. And that is um, the relationship between sex and autoimmunity. So this is a figure from your textbook. Um, it's showing a bunch of different autoimmune diseases. And it's showing basically the ratio of women who have that disease to men. So with Addison's disease, there are 12 times as many women as there are men. It's mostly found in women. That's why it's pink. Um, there are some that are closer to 50-50, and there are a few that are uh, mostly in men, but you can see, by and large, most of our major autoimmune diseases are found very predominantly in women. Um, you can see this table from another textbook here as well, showing you the ratio of women to men who have particular autoimmune diseases. And so one of the other sort of things that is seen really uh, dramatically in the autoimmunity literature is that there does seem to be this pretty massive predisposition um, of autoimmune diseases in women. Uh, there are a bunch of different hypotheses about what's going on. We don't have a clear answer, but let me tell you a few things that we think are part of this. One is that we know that leukocytes in general and lymphocytes in particular are very responsive to a lot of hormones. And so, of course, those lymphocytes and leukocytes are in a different hormone environment in males and females in terms of amounts of testosterone and amounts of estrogen. And so that could lead to different immune responses between the sexes. And so some of this may be related to, say, the role of estrogen on certain uh, cells. One other piece of this that um, is really also important is that if you look um, very closely at these data, you also often find that many of the autoimmune diseases in women start to show up after those women have had their first child. 
Um, and we know that the immune system has to undergo some pretty massive changes due to pregnancy, because as I've mentioned before, the fetus is foreign and we have to make sure we don't reject the fetus. Um, and so our immune system undergoes a bunch of different changes to allow the fetus to persist. Um, as a result, some of those immunologic changes may also um, predispose women who have had children um, to autoimmune disease. There's one other observation that has been made that um, seems to play a role here or that, that we, people think about as playing a role here. And this actually has to do with sort of immune responses in general. Um, it may actually be tied to that estrogen thing I was just telling you about, or it may be tied to some other stuff. But it turns out if you actually look at immune responses and you look at, say, the size of a T-cell response to a particular antigen, women make higher responses than men do. And this is just across the board. So if we look at immune responses to influenza, um, women make higher immune responses than do men. Um, and we can actually see all sorts of differences in terms of infectious diseases in what we see um, in women and men. It looks like the female immune system makes a larger response than does the male. That may, like I said, be related to hormones. That also may be related to a bunch of really important genes, being uh, immune genes being on the X chromosome. And so there being some changes in gene dosage. But it, we realize that we actually see um, more women suffering from diseases of immunopathology and more men suffering from diseases of um, pathogens causing damage. So if you think about kind of Goldilocks, women are going to be more likely on the too much side <laughs> and having the extra immune response causing damage. Men might be more likely to be on the too little side and having the pathogen causing damage. And we can see a number of different um, places where that uh, impacts. Um, I, this table that kind of talks about differences in outcomes in men versus women in a number of different viral infections is from uh, a review by a scientist named Sabra Klein. Um, she is super awesome um, in doing research on this stuff. If this is something that you find of interest, uh, she does kind of all of the, she, she is like the, the pioneer. And her lab has actually done work where they look at, say, um, immune responses in women before and after menopause, or on the pill or not on the pill, or things like that, um, to actually really try to work out how much of this is hormones and things. And it's, it's really fascinating. Um, to, they'll even look at like how one responds to a vaccine in all of these different situations. Um, so it's really, really cool. Um, so this as well, because you can see women seem to have just a larger immune response for reasons that are not completely understood, may be part of the reason why women are predisposed towards autoimmunity. Um, we can also think about um, which aspects of immune responses are involved in different autoimmune diseases. The key thing that I want you to realize about this slide, I went back and forth about, do I keep this one in, do I take it out, do I keep it in, do I take it out? The thing that's key, the reason why I kept it, <laughs> is because I'm going to spend a fair amount of time after this slide putting autoimmune diseases into categories of the antibody ones or the T cell ones. But if we really look, so if I look at rheumatoid arthritis, for example, yellow means that thing has been shown to be involved. And so if we look at rheumatoid arthritis, MHC class two antibodies, TH1 cells, interferon, NK cells, it's kind of across the board. So while I'm going to put rheumatoid arthritis in a group with this kind of immune response is important, know that a lot of that's oversimplification. And you can see almost everything on this table has some antibodies, has some T cells, <laughs> has actually a lot of things going on, even though we do classify them into these groups. 
So just realize that the classification I'm going to tell you is a little bit of an oversimplification. But it's an important classification. Um, and this is sort of the figure from your textbook that goes through this classification. One of the reasons why I'm pointing out some details of this classification, and this is something I do really like about this version of this table, is that it turns out that the mechanisms these little groups that we're going to put the diseases in turn out to be the same kind of groups that we put the allergies in. So if you learn the, the, the groups and the mechanisms here, then when later today I switch gears and start talking about allergies, it's going to be the same groups and the same mechanisms. And after Thanksgiving, I'm going to talk about transplants and transplant rejections. And transplant rejections fall into the exact same groups again. <laughs> um, and so these groupings are often kind of thought of as, as general themes. Um, and so I actually like, you can see this table lists um, type 2, type 3, type 4 for some of these autoimmune diseases. That type 2, type 3, type 4 naming is actually something we usually use for allergies and hypersensitivity. But these types of autoimmune diseases, have exactly the same processes that the type 2 allergies are going to have. And these types of autoimmune diseases have exactly the same ones as the type 3. And these have exactly the same ones as the type 4. So um, the more you can sort of start to think of these types as, and these like, OK, we got four different groups of mechanisms, it's going to be really helpful for you. Um, and so I do like how your, your book is paralleling that. Um, so the first group that is listed here are some autoimmune diseases that involve antibodies um, causing issues. And there are a bunch of different antibody-mediated autoimmune diseases. Um, in fact, on this table with the type 2, type 3, type 4, really two of them have antibodies involved. But right now, we're going to talk about a specific sort of way antibodies can be involved. And really, with these, we're looking at antibodies that are binding to some receptor on the cell surface. Um, when I think about these type 2 kinds of responses, I think about antibodies. And I think about an antigen being on the cell, like a cell surface receptor. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about Graves' disease and about myasthenia gravis um, in explaining these two. Um, though you can see here that there are definitely more that have these types of patterns. The reason why I pick Graves' disease and myasthenia gravis is because they show us the two different ways antibodies against a cell surface receptor can cause problems. Sometimes, when the antibody binds to the receptor, and again, you will see an example of this in a second, but sometimes the antibody will bind to the receptor, and it will make the receptor get a signal. It's like the antibody is like a fake antigen or a fake ligand for the receptor. And so it, it pushes the receptor <laughs> and says, hey, hey, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing, signal, 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 when it's not supposed to when we're not supposed to have signaling to that receptor. That's a case of an agonist. <laughs> Alternatively, sometimes the antibody binds to the receptor and blocks the receptor. It gets in the way, so the stuff that's supposed to happen can't actually happen. That is an antagonist. And so the reason why I pick Graves and Myasthenia gravis is because they show these two different examples. Um, so the first of these diseases I will tell you about is Graves' disease. Um, it is a relatively um, common autoimmune disease. Um, and the issue with um, Graves' disease is that patients will present with hyperthyroidism. Um, so too much thyroid. Their thyroid is too active. <laughs> um, this will have a number of different metabolic effects um, in these patients. So these patients sometimes have um, issues with fatigue, issues with 
weight loss issues. They have all sorts of uh, metabolic types issue, type of issues. And let's see here. Graves is one that's known as being pretty uh, female dominated um, as well. I think every person I have ever heard of, like in, socially in my life, you know, such and such as mother has or whatever is a female. I've, um, and so on the left is what is supposed to happen in normal physiology. So in normal physiology, sometimes the pituitary gland makes a hormone called TSH. TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. And if you had to guess what thyroid stimulating hormone does, what might you guess it does? Yeah. Okay, but and then what but what would it do like physiologically? Yeah, care me. Stimulates, stimulates the what? Doesn't it, the hormone stimulates something else? What does the hormone stimulate? Yeah, the thyroid. <laughs> so we make a, a hormone to stimulate the thyroid, call it thyroid stimulating hormone, and unsurprisingly, it binds to a receptor on the thyroid and makes the thyroid do stuff like make other hormones. So this is what it should look like. In patients with Graves' disease, they are they make an antibody that binds to that same receptor and stimulates the thyroid. So the thyroid starts making hormones when it wasn't supposed to. The pituitary never said, hey, make me hormones. We never had the pituitary making TSH. Instead, the antibody just bound to the receptor and the thyroid just makes hormones even if it's not supposed to. And so the, the thyroid is overactive. It's making too many hormones um, and this is causing problems. Um, and so this is an example of an antibody. Um, I think of it as an activating antibody or an agonist um, leading to an autoimmune disease. The alternative is seen in myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis um, is a disease that involves a lot of muscle weakness. And so patients will have um, a lot of kind of um, muscular issues, um, coordination, a lot of things like that. Um, on, again, on the left, we see what is supposed to happen. What is supposed to happen is that you are supposed to have, a ner have nerves that talk to your muscles. And the nerves send a neurotransmitter to the muscle and say, hey, muscle, move. <laughs> so in order to do this, my nerve had to send a neurotransmitter to my muscle <laughs> and tell my muscle to move. That neurotransmitter is called acetylcholine. So you can see that happening here. In patients with myasthenia gravis, they make antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. Now, these antibodies don't induce a signal. Instead, they block the uh, neurotransmitter from signaling. And so you can nev that nerve can never tell the muscle to be activated. And so our patient is going to have problems with coordination, muscle weakness, that kind of thing, because the nerves cannot tell the muscles to be properly activated. And so you can see these are kind of two different ways that antibodies could potentially lead to autoimmune disease. In either case, they're blocking some kind of receptor. Yes. Yeah, so see, we've got acetylcholine binds the receptor and then we get muscle activation. <laughs> yeah. Um, one other thing that often um, is a piece that is important with, with antibody-mediated autoimmune diseases like these is that some of these types of antibody-mediated diseases are, can actually be transferred for short periods of time from a mom to a baby. 
um, because if you remember, IgG antibodies can cross the placenta. And so if mom has one of these diseases, she may um, give those antibodies to the baby across the placenta and the baby may be born with one of these autoimmune diseases. Um, fortunately, we have ways that we can treat that. If the baby was born with the autoimmune disease, it would only be for a short period of time. It would not be for their whole life because we only transferred the antibodies. We didn't transfer B cells. Eventually those antibodies are gonna get degraded and the B cells aren't gonna be there to make more. So the baby's gonna get better. But at the beginning, the baby might have some of the same symptoms. Again, fortunately, we have ways that we can deal with this. There are some other autoimmune diseases that also can um, involve antibodies, but that involve those antibodies in a slightly different way. So in the cases like Graves disease and myasthenia gravis, we see antibodies against some cell surface protein. So the antigen is on a cell. There are other situations where antibodies are causing problems, but the antibodies are binding to antigens that are free proteins or free molecules floating around that are not on the cells. And so what happens is we get the production of these um, clusters called um, immune complexes or antibody antigen complexes. So some autoimmune diseases are immune complex diseases where we'll get these sort of big clusters, these big complexes of multiple antigens and multiple antibodies all binding together. So you can see these uh, two examples of immune complexes on the right. And what we can imagine happening with immune complex disease is that those immune complexes are gonna be big and are gonna mess things up in that, for example, they might get stuck in a blood vessel and block the blood vessel. Maybe they'll get stuck in the kidney where we're doing filtration and block filtration in the kidney. Maybe they'll get stuck in the skin and give weird rashes. Maybe they'll get stuck in the, in the alveoli, the little delicate tissues of the lungs. Um, and so oftentimes we'll see some immune complexes, we'll get some inflammation as we try to like remove them and we get sort of weird um, issues in, multi uh, in multiple places. There is one very, very famous immune complex mediated disease um, that I wanna talk about. Well, actually, I'm gonna talk about two diseases as immune complex mediated disease, but one of them is the famous one, <laughs> the most famous one. Um, and this disease is uh, officially known as systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. I always refer to it as SLE. Most everyone else in the world who is not an immunologist refers to it as lupus. <laughs> um, and this is sort of the big famous um, immune complex disease. We can see a lot of different types of symptoms in lupus patients. And each lupus patient will have a slightly different set of symptoms. So you can see symptoms of lupus can vary widely with the individual. <laughs> but some of the things we can see will be lung issues, like inflammation in the lung, heart problems, kidney inflammation, joint inflammation, um, as well as sort of issues with the heart, um, issues in the muscles, um, and often this very specific rash on the face um, that looks like this, that is known as the butterfly rash. Um, lupus is sometimes also referred to as the great imitator because its symptoms overlap with a lot of things. Diagnosis of lupus, because there's so much variation from person to person, is actually quite challenging. Most lupus patients are not diagnosed for a while. 
they sort of are like, I have these all sorts of weird problems and no one can figure out what it is for a while. And eventually they realize it's lupus, but those patients have usually suffered for a while. Um, if you go on YouTube, um, one thing that you will also find is that um, it was a running joke in the show House that the, the med students would always diagnose every patient with lupus. Like whatever random thing happened to a patient, the med student would be like, it's lupus. And House would be like, it's not lupus. There are, there are like YouTube compilations of House MD yelling it's not lupus in, from like every episode. Um, Cause this is, and it is in fact the great imitator cause it has so many similarities to so many other diseases. <laughs> um, all of these issues are really coming from those immune complexes depositing in different anatomic locations. And so each patient is going to have different immune complexes get stuck in different places and cause different things, but they might be in the lung, they might be in the kidneys, they might be at the joint, they might be in the skin, um, they might be in uh, blood vessels, and those are going to lead to these problems. And you can imagine kind of periodic immune complexes coming in, blocking up some body system, getting some inflammation, having this symptom, and then that symptom, and then the other symptom, and it kind of being difficult to uh, think about. So you can imagine, see some of the issues here, but we can also, there's one other piece that we should add on to this, which has to do with some of the antigens, because I, you see I'm not telling you about antigens here. Um, and um, when we look at lupus patients, there are certain antigens that we often see that they have antibodies against. So it's sort of this group of antigens are always the problem. And so those antigens are listed here. So we see, so there are lupus patients whose antibodies are all anti-DNA antibodies. There are others who have antihistone antibodies, others who have anti-RNA, some who have antiphospholipid, um, some that have anti-SNRP antibodies, which is part of the nucleolus, some have anti-ribosome antibodies. Um, what you might realize is that those are uh, pretty uh, common in the human body. <laughs> and so those antigens are basically everywhere. And so you can imagine those antibodies against those things depositing kind of anywhere at any time. Um, one of the ways that um, people are diagnosed with lupus is they will actually take serum from their blood. They'll take some of their antibodies and just put the antibodies on slides like this and see if their antibodies bind to the nucleus of cells. It's called, looking, it's called an ANA test, an anti-nuclear antibody test. And all you're looking for is, does the nucleus stain with antibodies in your blood? If so, then you probably have antibodies against one of these things. And that's not good. <laughs> um, and you can also see um, some of those uh, deposits here in the bottom. Um, so you can also imagine how many anatomic organs can be impacted because every organ has these antigens um, and the many different types of symptoms that we see. Um, and so what we often see happening um, in SLE, or at least kind of what we think might be going on in SLE, is that at some point, maybe you make an immune response to say, I don't know, one of these antigens. You make an immune response to an antigen. And maybe, we, maybe, for example, we start to get the cell dying. When the cell dies, it releases all this stuff. And all this stuff is linked. Remember linked recognition? And so not only, let's imagine you started making an immune response to H4 histone. Well, H4 could get phagocytosed along with all these other things, and we might actually start an immune response against some of these other antigens. So often you might start with an immune response against one, and because, say, histones and DNA and some of these other things are all closely linked together, 
you might actually end up stimulating even more B cells to give you to react against even more nuclear antigens through that linked recognition process and sort of get a little bit worse and worse because suddenly instead of having one uh, autoantigen you have many this process is known as epitope spreading um, where you start out making a problematic response to one antigen and one epitope like for example um, maybe you start out making a response um, to DNA, but now you can also, um, you, if you kill that cell, you know, that DNA is linked to a whole lot of other antigens, and we can get many different B cells activated, many different T cells activated, and suddenly, instead of having to worry about one antigen, we're worrying about many antigens. Um, so this is sort of something that we think is a big part of what we see with SLE. Uh, the other major immune complex disease that I want to mention um, is an immune complex disease called rheumatoid arthritis. Um, here you can see um, the hand of a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and see actually what kind of uh, swelling and issues are seen in the joints. Um, Officially, um, with, for rheumatoid arthritis, um, we see that uh, stiffness in the joints for at least an hour when one wakes up in the morning, um, a, a arthritis of a number of particular joints, symmetrical arthritis, um, things like that. So it, there are different types of arthritis. These are some of the diagnostic features of this one in particular. Um, the, uh, thing, the issues in the morning are a big part of it. But then the way that rheumatoid arthritis specifically gets diagnosed is that patients have um, this molecule called rheumatoid factor. And rheumatoid factor is an antibody that binds to the FC portion of other antibodies. And it could be an IgG, an IgA, or IgM, though it is often IgG. And so what you can see is that our, the antibody that's causing problems in many of our rheumatoid arthritis patients is this rheumatoid factor, and it's making a complex with other antibodies. And they're making a great big clump and causing problems in our patient, particularly depositing in the joints. Um, this antibody rheumatoid factor is found in uh, the vast majority of rheumatoid arthritis patients. However, we do see it um, with increasing uh, frequency as people get older in general. Um, so that does sort of complicate uh, diagnosis. Um, as I mentioned, just as a quick sort of little aside, um, I told you that I'm classifying a lot of these autoimmune diseases into groups, the antibody ones or the T cell ones or whatever, and that that's a little bit of an oversimplification. Um, I'm classifying rheumatoid arthritis as an antibody-mediated autoimmune disease because one of the ways you diagnose it is that there's an antibody, <laughs> rheumatoid factor. Um, but we, again, know that a lot of different immune responses are playing a role here. Um, if you actually look way back at the table I was showing you before, they listed rheumatoid arthritis as a T-cell-mediated disease. Um, and we actually know that if we look at um, thymic involution, whether the thymus goes away with age, the amount that the thymus has gone away is correlated with whether or not someone is getting rheumatoid arthritis. Like it looks like having good thymus function may help protect you from rheumatoid arthritis. And we kind of think that that might be related to the thymus making regulatory T cells <laughs> to help with tolerance processes. Um, so um, also we can sort of realize that there is you know, a role for T cells. And of course, well, yeah, you need T cells to help the B cells to make the antibody. So it's not exactly a shock that this isn't totally uh, separatable. Yes? Is there any way to try to avoid that? Uh, not that we are aware of. Um, after break, um, you will see there's a day, I'm gonna switch around when, where some of the topics go, but there is still gonna be a day called this. 
um, where I talk about immunotherapy. And we'll be talking about some of the ways that we treat some of these diseases. Um, but they're really, we don't necessarily have a way to predict or prevent rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I know that um, when my dad was uh, diagnosed with a different type of arthritis, um, they weren't sure for a while. And if he had had rheumatoid arthritis, I, as a, I don't know, eight-year-old, 10-year-old, I don't know how old I was at that time, would have had to have, start having blood tests because they might have thought that I might also have rheumatoid arthritis because he did. But that's as much as they could have done is start looking for it a little, like looking for those antibodies in my blood really early. Um, and then he didn't even have that kind of arthritis, so it didn't matter. But um, so there isn't really a preventative that they could, could do. Um, so we also can think about um, the fact that some autoimmune diseases are mediated by T cells. Um, you can see that this lists rheumatoid arthritis is one of those. Um, this also lists multiple sclerosis, um, which I talked a little bit about when I talked about Tisabri and um, immune privilege. Um, but the one that I'm going to tell you about today is type 1 diabetes. Um, so, in, so in the islets of Langerhans of the pancreas, there are three different cells types, or there are three important cell types, alpha, beta, and delta. Apparently, not only is it just immunologists who know the Greek alphabet, other people do too. Um, each of them have a different role. They make different hormones. In type 1 diabetes, CD8 positive T cells that are activated, so CTLs, specifically recognize peptides from the beta cells and kill the beta cells. And they are actually recognizing some insulin peptides in many cases. Um, and so the beta cells specifically are killed, but the alpha and uh, delta cells remain. And so now we've sort of shifted the balance between these um, hormones. We have no insulin production, and we also have, you know, have maybe too much of some of these other because of balancing between them. Um, we, and so as a result, we have no insulin, hypoinsulinemia, too little insulin, because we killed the cells that were making it. And we have hyperglycemia, too much glucose in the blood, um, which can cause a whole bunch of different other physiologic effects. When we look closely, um, we can actually pretty easily see the loss of beta cells. So this is what a normal pancreas should look like. The brown staining stains beta cells. This is what a pancreas of a type 1 diabetic looks like. So you can see all the beta cells are specifically killed. Um, and when we look, we also find that those islets are full of immune cells. So it seems like there has been this massive trafficking towards uh, the pancreas um, and particularly into the islet. Um, this is always discussed as, again, a um, T-cell-mediated disease, um, and it most certainly is a T-cell-mediated disease. There are CTLs that kill the beta cells. Weirdly enough, if you actually, we have now found that there are certain weird antibodies that type 1 diabetics make, and they actually make the antibodies before they present with diabetes. So before their insulin and sugar is off, you could find the antibodies in their blood. We don't really look for them very often, but in fact, you can sometimes find um, and tell a patient is going to be progressing and actually start working on treatments um, earlier if you happen to find those antibodies in those patients before they progress to type 1 diabetes. So again, it's a T-cell mediated disease, but there's something up with antibodies <laughs> um, that we might be able to use for diagnosis. Yeah, what was your question? So what we think happens is we think that um, this is one of the molecular mimicry examples from before. So there's a particular virus that has a um, epitope that is shared by the uh, beta cell only, that's only presented in people with certain MHC types. So that's what we think is going on. Um, in fact, one of the slides from last time was actually specifically a type 1 diabetes example in the molecular mimicry slides. Um, so that's kind of what we think. but. Again, with any individual patient, by the time their beta cells are gone, that T cell has been doing a lot of work. 
And so what made that T cell get inappropriately activated might have been 10 years before. And we can't go back and be like, what happened to you 10 years ago? You know, so it's hard. Yep. Um, so well, there are multiple types of diabetes. We're only talking about type 1 right now. Um, and, but with type 1, a lot of it is MHC type. Do you have an MHC type that is going to present that particular uh, peptide? Um, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit to talk about hypersensitivity. Um, hypersensitivity is sort of an immunology term for allergy. Um, so we're going to think about uh, some aspects of hypersensitivity or allergy. The difference officially between autoimmunity and allergy is that with autoimmunity, you are making an immune response to a self antigen. With allergy, you are making an immune response to what is known as an innocuous antigen, which is just a fancy word for harmless. It's foreign, but it's not actually anything that you really should be responding to. It's, it's completely harmless. You shouldn't be making a response. So as much as it doesn't feel like it in April, the trees are not trying to kill me. Um, pollen is, in fact, innocuous. But I happen to make this inappropriate response. So both autoimmunity and allergy are you're making an inappropriate response to something. You're kind of on the too much side of Goldilocks. But it's. Is it a self thing, a part of you, or is it a foreign thing that you shouldn't have responded to? We can look at genetic associations with allergies, just like we can look at genetic associations with autoimmunity. Um, I'll say more about this a little, in a little bit later. But in general, when we look at the genetic associations, we actually see basically very similar ones to the autoimmunity ones. So there are a lot of ways where hypersensitivity looks like what we see with um, autoimmunity and others. And we tend to um, divide up the hypersensitivity reactions into four types, type 1, 2, 3, and 4. It turns out that three of those types are actually the exact mechanisms I just told you about for certain autoimmune diseases. <laughs> um, so this hopefully will look familiar. Um, you will see that three of them also line up with some transplant rejection types. Um, there's one that is sort of unique. Um, the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction is something that we really only see as an allergy. We don't really see a sort of corresponding autoimmunity or transplantation response. Um, and so sometimes when people think about allergies, they often really think about the type 1 hypersensitivity responses. Um, but technically, all of these are hypersensitivity responses. Your textbook has a nice figure that kind of shows you the mechanism of each of the four. I'm going to walk through the mechanism of each of the four. But you may find this figure particularly useful for reference. Um, this is a similar figure from a different textbook. Um, and the reason why I'm showing you this one is because not only does this one have pictures, it also has some words <laughs> um, that can help us understand what's up. So we can see between our four types, type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4, a difference in what is the main part of the immune response that is causing problems. Types 1, 2, and 3 always involve some, all involve antibodies in some way. Type 4 involves T cells. Type 1 is unique because the antibody is Ig, an IgE antibody. Type 2 and type 3 are could be IgG or IgM. And the difference in type 2 and type 3 is in the antigen. 
in type two hypersensitivity, the antigen is something on the surface of a cell. So we might like destroy this cell or something like that because it has antigens on its surface. In type three, the antigen is a free molecule, like a free protein, and so we're making immune complexes. So in fact, you have just seen some type two, type three, and type four examples as we talked through different autoimmune diseases. The rest of our time today, I'm going to talk about some details of type one hypersensitivities. Um, we'll talk about some of the other hypersensitivities on Monday. And so we can think about this type one reaction, and this is the one that is unique to allergies. Um, Again, it's officially known as the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. But other immunologists know of it as, or other names for this, is the immediate type hypersensitivity. And so this is actually one of the things that defines this, if we think about symptoms, is the timing of those symptoms relative to when you see the antigen. When we are thinking about a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, we tend to see those responses within hours, say 24 hours, of you seeing the antigen. In some cases, it's within minutes. It's, in fact, immediate. <laughs> it's really quick. And that's something that's different from the other hypersensitivity reactions. So if you're, say, looking at old exams where I'm talking about different reactions, and I'm ask, I'll tell you a little story and ask you well, what happened, one of the things you might notice is if I tell you, within minutes, blah, blah, blah happened. The minutes is important. It tells you it's an immediate type <laughs> hypersensitivity reaction. Some examples of um, type 1 hypersensitivity reactions include anaphylactic shock, but also hay fever, yay, um, asthma, hives, food allergies, and eczema. And the way that all of these type 1 hypersensitivity reactions work is that they all involve IgE being a major mediator. Well, when that IgE is made, that IgE will bind to FC receptors on mast cells. And so we'll just have our mast cells sitting around with IgEs on them. And in fact, now that I think about it, there was a really cool slide or really cool image in your textbook that I cut out that now I'm like, man, I wish I had that image that showed a mast cell with like an antibody against cat dander, and then another antibody over here against like pollen and <laughs> whatever things. And if one those antigens, one of those antigens comes around, that will induce cross-linking of that IgE and release of mediators. And so what you can see is that you already have this cell kind of sitting around ready to go um, when in response to that antigen. And so you don't have to you know, make that IgE. You don't have to do much. Basically, this mast cell is full of these um, mediators. As soon as the mast cell is triggered, it releases things. And so that's how we're getting this immediate response, these immediate symptoms, is as soon as the antigen comes in, it cross-links the IgE, which was already preloaded on the mast cell, and the mast cell just immediately can release its mediators. There is one trick to this term of immediate type hypersensitivity. It is immediate asterisk. <laughs> because if you look at it, it requires IgE. That's in fact, the definition, when I think about mediators of a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, I think of IgE and mast cells. They're, they're my big players. IgE is important. How do you get IgE? Yeah. Class switch. 
you're going to have class switch to IgE. And so what actually will happen in an immediate type hypersensitivity response is that the first time you're exposed to the antigen, here's a person who is being exposed to a particular pollen, the very first time, that those allergens will um, stimulate an immune response, will get T cells, will get some helper T cells, eventually will get B cells, they'll class switch to IgE. That first time this person sees pollen, nothing happens. In term, nothing happens in terms of symptoms. If you ask them, were you, did you smell some pollen you were allergic to? They'd be like, no. Because what was happening was all these internal immunologic events of getting this B cell to class switch. Once that B cell class switches, it's going to make a bunch of IgE, and that IgE is going to coat the mast cell. And now we're going to have these IgE-coated mast cells just hanging out in this person's body forever, waiting if that, other, if that antigen is seen again. And if that person happens to breathe in that antigen again, now those mast cells are ready, and they're going to degranulate. They're going to take all of these little granule components and release them immediately to start to cause the issues. So in fact, an immediate type hypersensitivity response is immediate the second time you see the antigen. It's also immediate the third time you see the antigen, and the fourth, and the fifth. But it's not immediate the first time. So if, for example, you, so, uh, one type of immediate type hypersensitivity response is a bee sting allergy. You tend not to have really severe, you don't have a really severe response the first time you're stung by a bee. You have a really severe response the second time you're stung by a bee. Um, and so this is really all about kind of the immediate response the second time. Uh, if you see somebody who you know, has a severe response to a bee sting, you know they've been stung by a bee before, that it must be their second time. Um, so all of these issues are happening because of these products that are coming from the mast cell. Um, these are some of the products that are coming from the mast cell. Your textbook also talks a bit about basophil products here because, in fact, sometimes there are some basophils involved. I'm just going to sort of be simplifying all this to the mast cell part. I'm not going to talk a ton about the basophil part. But the mast cells can make a bunch of different things. Some of those things are cytokines, although the cytokines take a while. Cytokines aren't super immediate. Some of them are chemokines. But others are other types of molecules. Some of those molecules are enzymes. You might imagine that those enzymes could be important for killing certain pathogens, for helping to destroy those pathogens. They also could be important for some aspects of tissue remodeling and wound healing. Most frequently, we think about histamine, whose chemical structure is shown on the right. Um, there are also a bunch of lipids that are made, which are also shown on the right, um, some of which are known as arachidonic acid, prostaglandin D2, and leukotriene C4. Um, the reason why I actually mention those and draw them out is that you can see that there's these different lipids. They're known as just the lipid mediators. Um, they are interconverted with some um, enzymes. One of those enzymes is listed here as cyclooxygenase. Cyclooxygenase is a target of aspirin. So that's I've actually the only reason I put those st structures up there is so I can point out cyclooxygenase. Um, all of these products have some really important physiologic effects. So things like those histamines and those lipid mediators lead to vasodilation, as you see here. Can also lead to changes in vascular permeability, making those blood vessels have stuff leak out of them. You can imagine, like, yeah, good, inflammation, we're getting an immune response, hooray. Um, we also can see some bronchoconstriction with, based on those mediators. 
We can also see intestinal hypermobility. So things are going to move through your intestines real fast. Um, as well as some inflammation and some tissue damage. And you can imagine some of this being related to things like um, constriction of the throat and airways, because in fact, really all smooth muscle is contracting, which can make it hard to swallow, hard to breathe, make you wheeze. You can see the same smooth muscle is contracting in the GI tract, giving you stomach cramps, vomiting, fluid into the gut, diarrhea. All as a result of these uh, different types of products. The ones that are shown at the top, the amines and the lipid mediators, are the ones that are pre-made in the mast cell and are going to really start to cause issues right away. The cytokines do take a little bit longer. Um, and in fact, we tend to see in a lot of these type 1 hypersensitivity responses two phases of responses, both early and late phase responses. Early responses coming from those inflammatory mediators like, say, the histamine, um, the lipids, and then those cytokines actually causing some other issues later on. And you can even see this here. Here is actually somebody who has having an early, like immediate type hypersensitivity response to a particular antigen. But then you can see this massive swelling on the right, and you can see kind of a longer term what the cytokines are going to be doing in a late phase reaction. Um, some people, sadly, um, are, seem to be genetically predisposed towards hype, type 1 hypersensitivity responses. This particularly is um, related to having some genetic predisposition to making a lot of Th2 solid responses. So when you see antigens, it seems like your body wants to make a Th2 response. Um, this it seems to be related to genetics as well as perhaps to the environment. But those individuals who tend to have this pr genetic predisposition, they make a lot of type 1 hypersensitivity responses, are known as atopic individuals, or they have atopy. And oftentimes, people who have atopy and who are predisposed to making a TH2 response will have, say, a lot of um, allergies, nasal allergies, they might have asthma, they might have a lot of skin allergies, um, and they just seem to be allergic to all sorts of different things. Um, there, again, there are some sort of weird genetic associations. Um, some people who are very atopic tend to be um, people with extremely uh, pale skin. Um, there, there's a list of like other like features that seem to um, correlate with atopy. And so if you were actually to try to draw a picture of a person who might be atopic, you would draw me. And oh my gosh, I'm atopic. Shocker. Um, there are a lot of different genes that are involved in all of these different diseases. This is showing both a dermatitis example and an asthma example. You can see a lot of them are immune-based, particularly including class 2. But say in the case of dermatitis, there actually are some that involve the skin. So maybe you are just a person who makes Th2 responses, and because you also have some genes for weird stuff in the skin, your type 2 response became a skin problem. Whereas in asthma, maybe it's something that has to do with airway, because you also have some polymorphisms in some airway-related genes. Um, so some of the genes are kind of overlapping immune response genes. Some of them are unique to specific uh, things. Um, this is sort of where I'm going to start out on Monday. This is a list of many of the different types of antigens that tend to be our big type 1 hypersensitivity antigens. What you will notice is if you look at these, you don't necessarily think of all of these as giving you the same disease. You know. Pollen allergy and peanut allergy and nickel allergy do not, are not all things that you actually think of as having the same symptoms, but they're all type 1 hypersensitivities. And so what we're going to start with next time is how it is that the same exact process of type 1 hypersensitivity can give you different symptoms in different situations. Then we'll move into the other types of hypersensitivity responses. Um, remember, you have those two things due the Monday after break, if you feel like starting on them before. Um, and have a great weekend.